Today we'll be looking at Magnates Media and their video JP Morgan, The Man Who Owned America. I'll play the clip now. In 1871, John saw the golden opportunity to team up with one of the leading financiers in the country, a banker named Anthony Drexel. Together, they founded the Drexel Morgan & Co. Private Merchant Banking House, which was later renamed to simply JP Morgan & Co. And this would be the firm that John would manage for the rest of his life, serving as the precursor to the modern banking titan. Now this clip is a bit longer and I'll try and go slower so you can follow along easily. The main focus will be the 3D animation and highlighting. Remember that Magnate's media channel probably has a team of half a dozen editors working on these, so I'll do my best to recreate it as much as possible. For the images and overlay effects, we'll try and find some existing ones online. The first thing you need to do is compile all the static images and text. The more assets and images you can create in Photoshop before going into After Effects, the easier it'll be to manage. For example, I've found a lot of the faces online and using the polygonal lasso tool in Photoshop, I've turned them into PNG cutouts. I've also found the article used online and copied it into Photoshop, and then added the two images from Google and recreated it ready for After Effects. The first images of the three mobsters look very professional and even AI generated. They're quite hard to find online so I found a similar one on Adobe Stock. A lot of these channels will have access to stock images that are locked behind a paywall. We can just use the one with the watermark for this tutorial. I also found an AI image generator and created a mean looking old man. These websites are really good and shows what the future of image and thumbnail generation could look like. There's a lot of potential here. Next I photoshop the AI image onto the Adobe stock one and then separate the three mobsters onto their own layers. You can even create the chapter 2 text in photoshop and make it a PNG export. And then an image of what I think looks like a shield. It could be the front of a train which would be clever but a shield ended up being easier to find and use. Another useful tip I can give you is you can either export each layer as a PNG or you can set up all the images for a scene into one PSD file and import that PSD file into After Effects as a composition. This will allow you to access each individual layer within After Effects. You double click on the project panel and then find the Photoshop file. You can then drag these layers onto your composition. Next you can download some Fire and Spark overlays. So now we have nearly every layer used and can start stacking them into an After Effects composition. Now to create this fire around the shield we're just going to use the Saber effect. There's also Ecto from Red Giant Universe but this pack costs money. It's a better version of Saber however I want to try and show you free presets as much as possible but if you don't mind buying packs then it could be worth the investment for you. Add the Saber effect to a new solid layer, then go to the image layer, select layer, then auto trace, then alpha. Find the mask and copy it onto the solid layer. Then under the Saber effects panel change customized core type to layer mask. Then you can play around with the different presets and glow settings. For this one we can select the inferno preset and change the composite settings under render settings to transparent. This helps remove the black color around the glow. It's because of this shield that I had to add a big black solid layer around the side of the mobsters so I couldn't see the bottom of the shield sticking out. This helped create a more dark and shadowy look similar to the original Magnates Media clip. Sometimes you'll have to think of creative ways to fix or add fake elements to the composition to patch it up. Now this time instead of pre-composing we're going to create a new null object. Highlight both the shield and saber layer and then drag the pick whip onto the null object. This is very useful because now we can move and control both the shield and saber effect as one item by manipulating the null object. Okay so we have all our layers ready to go and what we're going to do is toggle on the 3D layer setting for every single layer except the fire and sparks overlay. The reason we don't make the overlays 3D is because we don't want them to move and swivel around in 3D space. We want them to remain 2D and stationary. For this editing breakdown I'll show the finished scene and talk about each of the layers and the camera setup since that's the main focus here. In the preview panel you can change the views to 2 or even 4 and you can change each preview window to show a different view of the composition. So to demonstrate what the 3D setup looks like I'll switch the second window to custom view 1 and we can use the orbit tool to get a good look at it. You can also cycle through the orbit, pan and dolly tool if you hold down the alt key and either left click, scroll wheel click or right click. This is a lot faster than having to select each one from the menu at the top. So the first frame layer is the three mobsters scaled up and close to the camera. We have the text layer closer to the camera but positioned lower just out of the camera lens view which is why we can't see it in the preview window. Now as 
I move through the timeline there are two main movements happening. The first is the camera's point of interest and position moving between two set keyframes making the camera move backwards which creates this zooming out effect. Switching to graph view for these keyframes both graphs are curved to the left and slow down towards the end. And looking at the camera settings I have depth of field turned on which is indicated by the smaller pink square in the custom view window. When I toggle this off and on you can see the square disappearing and appearing. This is how we control the focus distance aka where the camera is and isn't in focus. This basically creates a blur for everything that isn't in focus much like a real life camera. At the same time the text layer is slowly moving upwards into view and scaling down slightly to fit onto the screen. For this one I've added custom keyframes to make this transition faster and at the same time it's also being affected by the 3D camera. Switching to graph view shows a similar left leaning curve for the position keyframes. A keyboard shortcut that's useful is you can highlight all layers and press U. This will reveal all your keyframes only. This composition doesn't have too many keyframes on it. The two main layers I've had to keyframe is the camera's position and focus distance and then the text layer position plus scale as well as its own custom blur. I find it easier sometimes to add a custom blur on top of the camera focus distance. It was less fiddly but when you do your edits you can do whatever works for you. Sometimes the focus distance will be enough and other times you may need to add custom blurs. You may have noticed the time remap effect on the fire overlay. This is similar to speed duration in Premiere Pro. It allows me to slow down the fire overlay footage because the regular speed didn't look right. I'm happy with how this scene turned out. Obviously it's not a carbon copy because we couldn't find the exact same images but the animation looks very similar. Now this next scene was the hardest to do. There's a lot going on and I had to add a lot of custom keyframes and fake effects to get it looking as close as possible with the limited time I had. For this one there are four PNG images created in Photoshop. Two images were the two men and the other two images were the text layers. You can be lazy with the text sometimes if you don't need to animate them. Here I created the text in Photoshop and then imported them into After Effects. And then I added effects to these layers such as brightness contrast, glow, drop shadows. Remember you can add multiple drop shadows to a layer and change the direction for each one to give a deeper all round shadow. Then for the 1871 text I changed the blend mode to difference. Now much like the Magnates Media Clip this one has a bunch of overlay footage found on YouTube stacked on top of each other. Here I have a snow overlay set to screen blend mode, an old film noise set to difference mode, an old clock animation set to overlay mode, and animated gears turning as the bottom layer set to normal mode. Basically all these layers except the snow overlay is set to 3D mode. There's also these random solid and adjustment layers that aren't set to 3D which I'll cover later. The main thing to note is much like the last scene pretty much everything should be set to 3D except for the overlays you don't want to move in 3D space. Having a look at the custom view at the start of the timeline we can see all the 3D enabled layers with the camera layer we added. We can even see the picture of Anthony far behind the camera because he's not in the scene yet. We can't see the Anthony text because its opacity is set to zero at the start and fades in later on in the timeline. Now what you'll notice is that the custom view with all the layers floating in 3D space looks like a mess. All the layers and images look disorganized and barely fit into the camera view. This is completely normal when working with images and stock footage. There's nothing we can do about that but we don't need to. As long as our final scene has everything lined up and organized it doesn't really matter. The viewer doesn't see this and it's just the motherboard or the cogs and wheels of our 3D animation. The same goes for keyframes. If we look at all the keyframes in the composition it looks messy here too. This is normal and you have to do whatever it takes to make your edit look good no matter how messy and unorganized the backbone looks. The main movement in this scene is the camera which starts directly in front of the clock and cogwheel animation. Off to the side just out of camera view are the text and JP Morgan photo. Another thing to note is I have depth of field turned on but you can't see the focus distance box. That's because it's set to the same distance as the camera field box. I also have the aperture set to zero so there's no blur or depth of field yet. And as I move along the timeline I change both the focus distance and aperture values to create this out of focus into focus effect for the images as they come into frame. At the same time that the camera is moving back I've also got the JP Morgan Morgan photo's position sliding into view between these two position keyframes. This is another example of making use of simple extra layer movements as a way to support the camera. My advice is to use these when you need and it'll make life a lot easier than trying to do everything with the camera. Some other additional keyframing I've done is on the overlay clips like the clock, old film and animated gears. I've added position and scale keyframes and even a Z rotation for the old film. This ensures that they're moving in 3D space without having their borders exposed. 
The graph view for the camera movement shows the first curve leaning to the left and slowly easing into the second frame. The second camera movement goes back even further until the last two images appear in the camera's view. At the same time there's a roughly made brown overlay with a feathered mask set to subtract mode and it appears in the scene from simple opacity keyframes. I've had to create these simple quick edits due to how time consuming finding the exact textures and editing can be. Obviously your projects will have their own assets. The text also appears using opacity but I've added a track mat with a horizontal blur that moves from left to right to give the text a reverse crop animation. The next scene is the article with highlighting in 3D space and then a few images which will remain as 2D layers when we look at the custom view. You can see the camera in this one swings around a lot more and even rotates along the Z axis. The first thing we'll look at is the highlight effect. I have 3D enabled for the article in the first and second highlight layers. Both highlight layers have their blend mode set to multiply. Looking at the first highlight properties I have drawn three different lines using the pen tool with a yellow stroke. Now because each highlighted line starts and stops with overlapping keyframes, instead of adding one trim path to the entire layer we need to add three separate trim paths to each of the three lines. You can see in the timeline that the keyframes overlap, meaning the lines don't start highlighting right as the previous one stops. You can make them animate earlier and before the previous one has stopped. For each shape the trim path end property keyframes should be set at 0% for the first keyframe and 100% for the second keyframe. Do this for each line then select the keyframes and hit F9 to quickly smoothen the animations. Now because 3D is enabled for the highlighter and article, when we move the camera the 3D animation will affect both the article and highlight layers. As for the camera itself, in the graph view there are four curves that haven't really been changed. It's just the standard F9 auto smooth. And looking at the keyframes you can see I've copied and pasted the exact same keyframes right next to each other. This is something I like to do when keyframing. This helps create an easy frame hold before the next movement and it can stop the camera bouncing around wildly. It's up to you if you want to use this technique. I've also played around with aperture and focus distance to create a blur. The final scene in this clip is animating these four images in 2D space. So none of these layers are 3D enabled. I have the photo and text image coming in from the side. The text image has its anchor point set on the left. So when I add rotation keyframes, it moves around that anchor point. I've also toggled the motion blur setting for the text image and the building. At the end the building with the door closing scales down while the article and highlight layers have been parented to a null layer so I can then scale them down as one object. I've also added an adjustment layer with a blur effect keyframed and placed it between the text image and the article that's in the background. To make the door close I've added simple position keyframes as close together as possible so it snaps into position. That pretty much wraps it up. This particular one took a long time to do. Hopefully I wasn't too fast, let me know if there's anything you need me to go over again. I'll try and find a good balance between going too slow or fast. The assumption here is you have a basic understanding of these programs but you want to see how these particular creators use them in their videos. Thanks for watching, see you next time.